Okay, perfect. So today's webinar, Mom's Mental Health Matters, an evidence-based initiative to address perinatal depression and anxiety, will be presented by Dr. Trista Fowler from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. During the presentation, like I said, all night lines are going to be muted, but if you have questions, please bring them up on the chat box, and I will be happy to bring them to Dr. Fowler. So, um, Dr. Fowler, can you speak? Good afternoon. And I can hear you. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to hand it over to you, and there you go. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. And first, I would like to thank City Match for allowing um, NICHD to share our work that we're doing here in the area of perinatal depression and anxiety. I do offer my apologies uh, in the beginning of this presentation. Unfortunately, uh, my voice is waning a bit. So please let me know if you can't hear me or if it starts to kind of uh, peter out. But I'm going to... We're going to push through. So, um, again, this is addressing perinatal depression and anxiety, and it is a health education initiative. Um, the full name of our institute is the Eunice Kennedy Schreiber National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. I am a pediatrician and a medical officer and in the Office of Communications here at NICHD in Bethesda, Maryland. Next slide. Uh, just as a quick intro again, uh, NICHD is one of the 27 institutes of the National Institutes of Health, the kind of the, the center of medical research here in the United States. Uh, we're located here in Bethesda, Maryland. Next slide. Um, unit, the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Um, our mission here covers the entire breadth of maternal and child research, including um, not only uh, development before and after birth, maternal or child and family health, reproductive biology and population issues, as well as medical rehabilitation. So we have a very wide scope here at NICHD. Next slide. At NICHD, I lead the National Child and Maternal Health Education Program. That is the education program of the NICHD. It's very much like um, a lot of the education programs here um, at NIH that you may be familiar with, the Red Dress Campaign, the Cholesterol, the Asthma uh, Education Program, but a little bit different in that our education program covers the entire breadth of research that we do here at NICHD. It does not have a disease focus. At the center of our education program are our coordinating committee, which is made up of 30 of the nation's most uh, prominent health care provider associations in maternal and child health. Next slide. These are just a few of the 30 of our organizations that are a part of our coordinating committee. Um, they do include the professional societies as well as our sister agencies that are a part of Department of Health and Human Services, um, as well as some patient advocacy groups such as First Candle, uh, March of Dimes, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. So this really is the champion of the education program. It is operated in a roundtable format. All of these organizations have a seat at the table. We discuss all of our initiatives in the beginning, how we're going to address them from an education perspective. All the organizations approve each and every item that we put out, and they also promote all our items. So it's very much a collaborative experience. I just want to definitely give them all the credit because without uh, our coordinating committee, we could do um, none of, of the good work that we do. Next slide. Um, this initiative addressing perinatal depression and anxiety is a third initiative for MCHIP. That's what we call the National Child Maternal Health Education Program. Um, so I definitely encourage you not only to um, want if you want to know more about um, this initiative that I'll be talking about, but if you want to know about some of our other initiatives, to definitely to, um, I have some information at the end of the presentation where you can go online and learn about our other initiatives. Next slide. So um, this, what I'm talking about today is perinatal depression and anxiety, and many of you may be familiar that unfortunately perinatal depression and anxiety does not have its own di distinct diagnosis. Um, in the DSM-5, however, it is a kind of a um, subcategory of depression with a peripartum onset. However, our research now indicates that women are not only at risk for this perinatal and depression and anxiety after postpartum, but also during pregnancy as well. Next slide. Our research has not been able to elucidate exactly what is the um, cause of perinatal depression and anxiety, but our research has given us a lot of information about the factors that are associated with increased risk of perinatal depression and anxiety. These may include a history of depression in the mom, a family history in her family, a traumatic pregnancy or birth experience, 
And I would like to expand a little bit about um, the definition of a traumatic pregnancy or birth experience. I think um, anything obvious such as an accident or uh, a pregnancy uh, that has a uh, stat C-section um, due to trauma or some type of outside event, we all would understand would be traumatic. But for some moms, even the idea of having to have a C-section when their entire pregnancy they were really dreaming of a kind of a lifetime TV experience where they can push the baby out and everything goes according to plan, having a C-section, having the baby have some transient tachypnea or any type of uh, small um, what we may consider a small consequence may be very traumatic for the mom. So I want to kind of expand your thought of traumatic pregnancy or birth experience to include not only those that are evidently a traumatic, but also something that may be traumatic just in the perspective of the mom. Poor partner relationship quality, multiple births, lower socioeconomic status, um, a low, which goes along with lower levels of social support, unintended pregnancies, and again, I'd like to use that term very widely because here in the United States, we um, most of you are familiar with most of the pregnancies are unintended. So that's a very wide category. Teen pregnancy. Teen pregnancy is a particularly interesting um, affected subgroup of women um, that suffer from this. Uh, a lot of times these women go undiagnosed because, as you can imagine, teen pregnancy by itself comes with a extreme amount of stress. A lot of these teenagers lose their family support, as you can imagine, from disapproval from their parents. They're often alone for the very first time, learning how to be adults when they're very much still children and learning how to grow up themselves. Having a pregnancy can be very traumatic. A lot of these teenagers involve themselves in self-medicating behaviors and also become misdiagnosed because of those behaviors, but really may be suffering from perinatal depression and anxiety. So I definitely wanted to draw your attention to that population. The other population that um, is affected by perinatal depression and anxiety is military service. As you can imagine, these women have babies often away from their spouses, away from their families, even in different countries. So it's very um, important to include them as a high-risk population for perinatal depression and anxiety and, of course, domestic, domestic violence. Next slide. Research has also done a really good job of helping us to identify what are some signs and symptoms of perinatal depression and anxiety. Um, one very important aspect that research has brought out that I know many of you are familiar with the common term of postpartum depression or PPD. Um, research has definitely helped us expand that to include what I've been calling on this presentation perinatal depression and anxiety. A lot of women, um, when t when questioned or interviewed or having um, a discussion about perinatal and uh, depression and anxiety often don't resonate with the depression symptoms. They often um, indicate that what really impressed upon them was the anxiety. So that's why you'll hear throughout this presentation, I am including perinatal depression and anxiety. So some of the signs and symptoms that research has um, brought to light are persistent sadness, impaired concentration or indecisiveness, a disconnection with emotions. These women also often comment that they feel like they're robots. They're going through the motions. They're kind of a third party in their lives. They see themselves doing these things, but they don't really have any emotion attached to it. Anxiety around their newborn. Um, they may not feel that they're connecting with them like they should. Um, very anxious about danger, endangering them and, and about their welfare. Irritability of mood changes feelings of inadequacy or guilt, feeling that they're not going to be a good mom, feeling that they're not doing things correctly or that, you know, nothing they do is correct. Um, lack of interest in the newborn, as we talked about a little bit earlier, but also something that women really remark on, not so much about, um, in, or not, I shouldn't say not so much, but in addition to not connecting to the newborn, is what struck them was they weren't connecting toward their previous children. So they may have had a great relationship with the children that, you know, their earlier children, but um, but something happens where they have this new baby, and not only are they not interested in the newborn, they're not interested in their existing children as well. So that's something that women really um, brought to light and said this is something that let them know that something was not right. Also, it was this idea of racing thoughts. And when I talk about racing thoughts, I kind of want to um, have you think about maybe like an OCD type of a syndrome uh, where you have these thoughts that women say they know are irrational, they know they are not real, but they just cannot get rid of them. For example, um, 
we talk to a woman in our focus group, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but just to give an example, um, she was in the second floor of her home, and it had a banister, which would lead down to her steps. And she said, you know, she'd been in the house for 10 years before having the baby, but she just had this overwhelming feeling after she had the baby that she was going to fall off the steps and that she was just going to trip over the banister, and, and her and the baby were just going to fall. So her way of preventing that was just to never go downstairs. And although she knew that was very irrational, and she'd been in the home for 10 years, and she knew it was very structurally sound, and, and that the idea of her falling over would, would be a very rare occurrence, unfortunately she couldn't get rid of this fear that she was going to fall over the banister. So that's just an example of these racing thoughts. And again, women know that they are not real or based in reality, but they just can't get rid of them. Next slide. We also have a very good idea of some of the um, adverse effects of perinatal depression and anxiety, some which you may be very familiar with. Uh, prenatally, this may lead to poor nutrition. You may not keep up with your prenatal care. Unfortunately, there is a risk of suicide and harmful health behaviors. And a lot of these behaviors often are self-medicating. I talked about that a little bit earlier. And unfortunately, these women do go undiagnosed because of these harmful health behaviors, they may come to light as uh, drug users or alcohol users or some other substance. And unfortunately, a perinatal depression and anxiety um, diagnosis may, be, may have been lingering in the background. For postpartum adverse effects, as you can imagine, a disruption in maternal and infra interaction is associated. Um, there are some studies where following the children of women who have, have suffered from perinatal depression and anxiety, um, they've exhibited some cognitive and language developmental delays, as well as low social engagement, stress, and fear reactivity. If you can think about it, and I think all of you would agree on the line, that those first years, or those uh, first years, excuse me, days and months with an infant are very important because the way they relate to you is their first kind of um, window until they relate to the world and how they um, receive emotion and how they receive care and how they receive other people. So if that is altered by a mom suffering from perinatal depression and anxiety, you can understand how possibly as the child grows up may have some problems with social engagement, some stress, and some fear reactivity. Next slide. All of uh, the specialties that are affected by perinatal depression and anxiety, uh, obstetrics and gynecologists, our pediatricians, nurses, and mental health professionals, I think we all agree that screening is very important. Um, they're as you can see on the slide, in various um, increments, um, but all of us agree 100% that screening is very important. The problem with perinatal depression and anxiety is getting a woman in for screening. Um, as you all may be aware, a lot of women don't necessarily go for their six-week postpartum visit, and that's a lot of the times when this uh, screening would occur in your obstetrician and gynecologist's office. For pediatricians, as you can imagine, the patient is not actually the mother. The patient is the baby. So getting pediatricians to include screening within a very large list of things that we have to do when we see a newborn or a well-child visit can be a challenge. Um, also, um, parents tend to not be as forthright with pediatricians because they have a fear of their children being taken away from them or child protective services being involved. So that's a barrier there. Um, the nurses are very involved in this as well. Mental health professionals overwhelmingly agree that these women need to be screened and would love to come in and treat them. Unfortunately, uh, because of the overall stigma of mental health in this country, and then on top of that, the I think the fear of a new mom believing that she's not doing it right or, or not connecting with her mom definitely prevents mothers from going into to see mental health professionals, even if they are referred. Also, um, there's a fear of the breastfeeding um, issue. A lot of people think immediately when they talk about mental health that they're going to prescribe me a medication or going to put me on a drug, and that will maybe affect my baby in breastfeeding. Um, and they're not aware that there are a host of other treatments for perinatal depression anxiety, including cognitive behavioral and those kinds of things. But because what they may think of popularly is medication, they shy away from coming to mental health professionals. But I think we're all in agreement that screening is very important. And one of the major aims of this initiative is to get women into screening and to make them aware of perinatal depression and anxiety. Next slide. The Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale is the gold standard. This is the long form. You may be familiar with other shortened versions. I believe there's even a one-question form of this, but this is the gold standard. It's used in different forms by the other specialties that we just went over um, in the last slide, but this is definitely the gold standard. Next slide. 
I wanted to go over a little bit about our material developmental process for our Moms Mental Health Matters initiative. Um, this initiative was um, a little different than some of the other initiatives that we addressed. One, because um, here at NICHD, we do take care of and have a lot of research on um, maternal and child health, but mental health is not necessarily seated in this institute. So we wanted to be sure to involve our sister institute, the National Institute of Mental Health, as well as other organizations and patient advocacy groups in this initiative because, um, and my apologies, very weird occurrence, the electricity just went out in my office. So if you'll give me one second, hopefully I'm going to log back on. And there we go. It's back up. I apologize. Um, so, again, um, we wanted to involve these organizations very early in the um, development of this initiative because we wanted to make sure that anything that we put out about um, perinatal depression and anxiety was not duplicative and that resonated with these women. And we already knew that it was going to be a very sensitive topic. We had discussion groups. We worked in conjunction with Postpartum Progress. Um, they are the leaders of the Warrior Mom Conference. We had discussion group sessions at those conferences asking women about how they felt about perinatal depression, perinatal depression and anxiety. For those of you who are not familiar with Postpartum Progress, it is a very large um, platform patient advocacy on perinatal depression and anxiety. Most of the women have been diagnosed and are survivors, and um, they work together in an online group to support other women. So they come together once a year in a warrior mom conference. Um, so we thought it was a great occasion to talk to women who have been diagnosed with perinatal depression and anxiety to get them to um, talk about what we wanted to do and what's needed in their environment. We also worked with Postpartum Support International. They are also a very large group of patient advocacy group on perinatal depression and anxiety. Um, they helped us tremendously, both groups, in developing my materials, making sure that we, again, had things that resonated and things that were needed in the field. Next slide. Moms Mental Health Matters, when we wanted to, again, talk about what the focus would be, um, I think it was an educational initiative, obviously, because that came out of our education program. We wanted to expand the understanding of postpartum depression to reflect the current research, not only here at NSCHD, but um, throughout the field. We wanted to raise awareness among pregnant and postpartum mothers and their families about the symptoms of perinatal depression and anxiety and connect them to resource. This was a really you know, a, a big issue in perinatal depression and anxiety is awareness. A lot of women and their families are not even aware that this can actually happen. And so they think that they're the only ones and they suffer in silence. So we wanted to raise awareness that perinatal depression and anxiety is common and it is treatable. We also wanted to educate providers about the symptoms of perinatal depression and anxiety, screening, and communicate effectively with patients and their families. So not only did we want to use this initiative to educate uh, patients, but also providers with the current research about perinatal depression and anxiety occurring not only in the postpartum period but also the pregnancy, highlighting the symptoms of anxiety that most women resonate with, um, also giving them effective language so they can communicate and understand what these women are going through, as well as how to under explain perinatal depression and anxiety to their families. Next slide. One of the first products I'd like to go over for you is our action plan. This is kind of the centerpiece of the Moms Mental Health Matters. Um, this action plan is very much in the um, – You are, some of you may be familiar with the asthma action plan. I'm a pediatrician, so this is kind of where I live and are very familiar with that. It's a way in which we explain to families um, who have asthma – when their children are going to need our, you know, regular medication, where they're kind of in a danger area, which is the yellow zone, and when they're in a red area where you need to seek help immediately, go to emergency room or give us a call. So we wanted to use this asthma, the stoplight, just like we use an asthma action plan for an action plan for depression and anxiety around pregnancy. We also are responding to research that was funded out of National Institute of Mental Health, where a lot of, of the minorities and those disparate populations um, indicated that with them, if someone was to bring up a issue, not only perinatal depression and anxiety, but bring to their attention something that their population was affected by, they not only wanted to hear what it was or what to do about it. They needed action steps. They needed action items. So, again, we developed this action plan. The stoplight is, is, is a very uh, universal symbol. Um, it can be easily understood. It doesn't matter what educational level you're at. So that was another reason why we used it. In the green zone, 
this is where um, a lot of the symptoms, because you see it's kind of two-sided if you, and on the other side it tells you what to do. So on the left side, it's kind of the symptoms, and on the right side are your action steps. So in the green area, these are the symptoms that most folks may hear about called uh, baby blues. These are those that, you know, feeling like you just aren't yourself, having trouble managing your emotions, feeling overwhelmed. These are things that women, all women who knew first-time moms or even moms who have had uh, children before may be feeling. It's very common. Um, these symptoms are should go away. They're, still lim they're limiting. They should not progress. And although, you know, you should take special care of yourself and always be aware of them, this is, this is when you're in the green zone. This is when you're okay. The yellow zone is where we want to catch women. These are the symptoms are, that are significantly associated with perinatal depression and anxiety. These are the symptoms that came out not only of the research on perinatal depression and anxiety, but also out of our discussion groups and really talking to women about if you were to name one symptom that let you know that something was not right, what would it be? And kind of putting that all in this yellow area. So I'm going to go over them quickly. Having feelings of intense anxiety that hit with no warning. I spoke about that a little bit earlier. A lot of women, again, really remarked that anxiety was the number one symptom that was brought to their attention to let them know that something was not right. Again, not feeling foggy and having difficulty completing tasks, feeling robotic like you're going through the motions. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Loss of interest in things you enjoy, anxious around the baby and other children. And this is an indication of those racing thoughts. It says if you have scary, upsetting thoughts that don't go away, and finally feeling guilty and feel like you're feeling at motherhood. This is where we want to catch most women. This is where we want women to know, number one, as we say on the opposite side, these feelings will not go away on their own. Uh, women are, um, you know, as leaders of the family and, and, and always very busy multitasking, we kind of neglect ourselves and feel like these things will go away if we just keep pressing through. And what we want to indicate to women that these will not go away on their own. That's the most important point. You must seek help. You must contact your health care provider. We sell health care. We say health care provider because we don't want to specifically indicate your obstetric gynecologist because, in truth, we really want women to talk to whoever they feel most comfortable with. If that's your doula, if you want to go back and talk to them, if it's your nurse practitioner, if it's a nurse, if it's, you know, your internist or your family medicine practitioner or even your pediatrician, it's whomever you feel more comfortable with. We also indicate in this yellow area a contact for Postpartum Support International. They have a warm line, and that line will help link you to a volunteer that will provide you with support and resources in your area, no matter where you are in the U.S. Uh, we also encourage you to talk to your partner, family, and friends because, again, as I talked about earlier, a lot of these women tend to suffer alone because they can't explain what's going on. They tend to suffer alone and, unfortunately, a lot of symptoms to progress. Moving on to the red zone, um, this is the 911 zone. This is the get help 9 zone. This is the zone that frequently you hear about stories in the press and have been in the news uh, recently these are women that may be progressing to something called postpartum psychosis. So they may be going beyond a diagnosis of postpartum depression and anxiety and moving into postpartum psychosis. So they want them to understand, as well as their family members, if they're also looking at this action plan, that this is an immediate issue. Uh, the symptoms in this area is feeling hopeless and total despair, feeling out of touch with reality. Um, these women begin to have see and hear things that other people don't. They begin to hallucinate, so this becomes a psychosis, begins to emerge, and obviously feelings that you may hurt yourself or your baby. Um, on the right side, again, we indicate this is a 911 immediate issue. We indicate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, we also have the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services or SAMHSA's National Helpline as well because those are all hotlines that you can call someone immediately in English and Spanish and get help. So just as a review, this is kind of our cornerstone. This is where we want a lot of the education to occur for those who will be talking about perinatal depression, anxiety, be a provider, a nurse, um, the pre, um, prenatal classes, et cetera. This is kind of your, your one-stop shop. If you had to think of one product that you would go for, it would be our action plan. All of our products have what you see circled in yellow here are called the action. These are our buttons that if, you know, if what would catch your eye if you're looking at this product, and a lot of these came directly out of our discussion group conversation with women. Um, one thing they said that Try to normalize. Find a way to normalize depression and anxiety so that we don't feel like we're the only ones. So on the action plan, it says depression and anxiety happen. Getting help matters. 
we want to illuminate that this is this can happen. You're not abnormal. You're not the only one. But the most important thing is that getting help. So, again, encouraging them to get help. Next slide. Another thing that came out of the discussion group conversations, um, over and over and over, women said, if I just had something that I could give to a partner, give to a spouse, give to a family member to help them understand what I was going through. I didn't know what to call it, so I didn't know how to explain it. So we also wanted to utilize the idea that partners may be that first person to recognize when a new person, when a new mom is experiencing postpartum or pre perinatal depression anxiety symptoms. So we wanted to arm them with the information and education if they are seeing these symptoms of what to do. We also wanted to make, create a product that created acceptance and support to let them know that this wasn't, this is not abnormal, they're not the only ones, this is a very real uh, symptom and it can be treated and there is recovery. Next slide. So what we created are what we call our conversation starters. Uh, this is something that, as a healthcare provider, you could present along with the action plan. <clears throat> excuse me, the action plan to the family support, the partner, or the spouse that comes in with the mom. It says, "Talk about depression and anxiety during pregnancy and after birth. Ways you can help." So it indicates what they should listen for. Keep it open the line of communication. Um, you know things that. Here, I know everyone is focused on the baby. You tell them, but I want to hear about you. I notice you're having trouble sleeping, and when the baby sleeps, you want to offer support. Let her know she's not alone, and you're there to help. And some ways to, to to do that. And then we wanted to offer help. We also wanted to supply the same numbers that are on the action plan on the conversation starter as well, so that your support system and your family and spouses also have the same information that may be indicated on the action plan. On the other side of this conversation card is. Um, during pregnancy and after birth, learn the signs of depression. So this becomes a little bit more of the education where we indicate what things are troubling and what you should be aware of. Um, does she seem to get extremely anxious, sad, or angry without warning? Do you notice she has trouble sleeping? So, again, ways in which to make partners, spouses, family support aware. Um, at the yellow arrow, you see indicated that call out, depression, and anxiety happens, getting help matters. Next slide. We also have developed some posters, again, out of our discussion groups, and we wanted these posters to resonate. Um, this poster is you're almost prepared for anything, but are you prepared for the possibility of depression and anxiety? Again, this is the effort to normalize perinatal and depression, depression and anxiety because just like dirty diapers, as indicated at the top of the poster, dozens of laundry and feedings in the middle of the night that you, you know, in the what to expect, what you're expecting, this is something that all moms know that they're going to go through Perinatal and depression and anxiety is right along with that. Um, also, as indicated by the arrow, you see our icons indicating some of the symptoms that were on the action plan um, to let those who are reading the post understand our symptoms of perinatal depression and anxiety, intense worry or anger, extreme mood swings as indicated by the roller coaster. Uh, we use icons that because we've had research has shown that people resonate a little bit better with the remembering symptoms and remembering things when they have icons to kind of show to associate them with. And then you see circled in that bright yellow our call to action on this poster, which is reach out, get help, you matter. Again, this is letting moms understand to getting help is most important and that you matter because as a new mom, again, you may think that your baby is the focus, which, you know, as a mother, we myself, I that is, you know, very much in present. Our children are in focus. But if we aren't well and if we aren't don't take care of ourselves well, then we won't be able to care for our children. So indicating that you matter as well. You also see underneath um the poster again um our um number for where you can find help with a mental health provider in your area. Next slide. Our second poster is something that the women in our discussion rooms also brought out. Um, what if the happiest time in your life doesn't feel so happy? That was a statement that was repeated over and over again in different uh, forms by women. I was supposed to be happy, but I wasn't. I didn't know it was wrong. This was supposed to be the best time of my life, but it just wasn't. Um, initially, when we developed this poster, we had different pictures. We had pictures of women that were kind of in intensively thinking and with providers kind of in a concern type of mood. And overwhelmingly, women indicated that that's not what would catch my attention. I would walk past that poster without even thinking about it. What would catch my attention is if you had happy babies and happy 
you know, pictures, but yet on top of it, what if the happiest time of your life doesn't feel so happy? So that's why this poster was developed. Again, you see by the arrow of rep- rep- repeated um, icons and the symptoms, and then the call out for this poster is reach out if you don't feel right. This was a direct quote from one of our discussion group participants. She said, the only thing I can remember is, and I kept telling family members, is that I don't feel right. I didn't know what I felt. Again, I didn't have a name for it, but I just didn't feel right. So we thought it was um, good to kind of put that on our poster in case other women are feeling the same way. And, again, you see the number for help. Next slide. All of our products, um, and I'll share with you in a, at the end where they're available here to NICHD at our um, resource center for free to be shipped all around the United States for free. All of our products are also translated in Spanish. The Spanish translation is not a direct translation. It's a translation for understanding. Um, we wanted to make sure that women really understood what these symptoms mean. And as you can imagine, it's very difficult to translate from English feeling robotic or fogginess. So we wanted to make sure it wasn't just a direct translation, but so that they really understand what that symptom meant. So if those of you who do speak Spanish and with your Spanish-speaking patients or providers, we always tell them that it's on purposely not a direct translation because we really want it to resonate with our um, Spanish-speaking patients. Next slide. I went over this a little bit earlier, but just to highlight the numbers that are on all of our products, Substance, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration number. Um, this, The SAMHSA, for the very first time, allowed us to actually train their call operators on Moms Mental Health Matters materials because they said if we're going to have the number on there, we want to make sure that our operators know what people are referring to if they say, hey, I have this action plan about perinatal depression and anxiety and your number was indicated. So we came in for the first time and trained their call center operators. Uh, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, and again, I talked about a little bit earlier, the post crime Support International Warm Line. Next slide. I'm very happy that all of our products have been distributed across um, all the 50 states in one territory. Um, New York, Illinois, Texas, California, and Florida are currently our highest um, requesters. Um, I wish this whole map was purple. So for those of you on the phone um, who live in some of these other areas, not only the purple ones, the blue ones as well, we would love to send materials. We want to get them into as many hands as possible, as many organizations as possible. Next slide. So far, um, this um, initiative launched last year. We've had overwhelming, you know, very good response from all of our um, folks who have seen it and have looked at it. They've all indicated, you know, how they thought it was great that the Spanish not only resonated or not only, as I said, translated, but women actually understood what it meant. So we're very happy about that. Um, and. I think our first materials were shipped on March 21st, 2016, and at present we have about 15,000 copies that have been shipped. So, again, we'd love to expand this in number as well as areas. Um, you'll see some WIC um, in Los Angeles and some other states have also um, – next slide. I'm going to think it's on the next slide. Yeah, here we are. Um, we saw some uh, WIC – clinics in Kansas, I think Los Angeles, and one other than in Texas that have picked up the program, a lot of programs that are teach perinatal classes, hospital programs, uh, employee health programs as well. These are just a few of the ones that we listed here. Again, we'd love to expand this. If there's organizations that you know of, for those on the phone that we should get in contact with that could use these programs that we haven't previously gotten in contact with, please let us know. Or, again, if you're on the phone with like our products, again, they are free. Um, no matter what the number, if you do have a bulk request, um, the system will prompt you to put in a little bit more information, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be approved, but it does um, prompt you to put a little bit more information in so we don't have a limit on the amount of products that we ship. Next slide. I just wanted to go over quickly for anyone on the phone that wants to share about our education for providers. Um, this was um, we did in conjunction with Medscape. Um, this was our CMEC program, not only for our physicians but nurses as well. It's not just postpartum. It's not just postpartum. It's not just depression. Again, we did that in conjunction with Medscape. Um, they helped us to promote it and helped us to get um, providers in and and to participate in it. Um, unfortunately, it I don't believe. It was only accredited through August 10th. Next slide. So, unfortunately, it's not available for accreditation. Um, but 
Um, it is going to be housed on our website, meaning the NIC NICC website. Um, it's going to be housed there. So if you just want to review it or you want to direct people to review it, they can. Um, the target audience would be primary care providers, obstetrics and gynecologists, nurse practitioners, nurses, and pediatricians. Again, the goal is to educate them about perinatal depression and anxiety. Next slide. Um, we had about 25,000 learners who have come across the CME slash CE. We've awarded 12,000 over 12,000 certificates. Again, our nurses overwhelmingly have loved this program and has really taken it on and have um, spread the news about it quite adequately. We have 18,000 nurses take this CME slash CE, 5,500 approximately physicians, and then 1,300 other um, healthcare providers. Next slide. Here's our website. Um, if you want to learn more about Moms Maternal Health Matters as well as the other in initiatives that have come out of MCHIP, this is our website. Um, this website here will take you directly to Moms Maternal Health Matters, but if you click around a bit, our other initiatives will be there as well. To order materials also is at that website. You can also call or email our bulk orders to that email. That's our Information Resource Center. Um, again, they will prompt you for a little bit of information, but don't let that discourage you. It's just so that we have it in our system. But they will be approved, and again, they are shipped for free FedEx around the country. Next slide. That's all I have for you today, and I'll be open for questions. Thank you so much. So I have a question. Um, are copies of these posters available for download online? Yes. At that, if you go back one slide. At the website. Yep, there we go. At that website, um, all of everything is a PDF on the website as well, so you can download them and, and print them out yourself. Or, again, you can order the bulk um, bulk copies or just uh, copies from the Information Resource Center. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and unmute the lines. The conference has been unmuted. Hear what? Oh. And somebody has put us on hold. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute everything again. The conference has been muted. And if you have a question, please press star 7 to unmute yourself, and we're here. Oh, and I have another question. Can Dr. Fowler speak to how new organizations would partner with Moms Mental Health Matters? Oh, Dr. Fowler, I muted you as well. Give me one second. Let me find you. Okay, Dr. Fowler, you should be. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, yes, definitely. We're always interested in learning who we can partner with, new organizations. I don't believe that my email, it may be on that first slide. If not, I apologize for neglecting to put that on there. But um, it's, no, it's not. I apologize. It's Fowler, F O W L E R L T, at mail.nih.gov. Um, again, F O W L E R. LP at mail.nih.gov. Um, again, if you have other organizations that would love to partner with us, we'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to um, collaborate. Okay. Um, I have a comment. Oh, hi. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, this is Marcia Grease. I'm with Community of Hope. Um, I oversee their return on child health programs. I had an opportunity to go to the PSI conference uh, in Philly, and um, they un uh, unveiled that they or, um, they added another arm to PSI that focuses on women of color. So mm. um, the Perinatal Mental Health Alliance for Women of Color. And the goal of that is to identify um, clinicians of color to refer um, um, moms to and also to have a um, PSI coordinator who is a woman of color in every, I guess, in every PSI jurisdiction. So... I just wanted to put that out there. There may be a good organization to collaborate with because uh, they're really new. They just um, implemented this initiative, I think, within the last couple months. Oh, thank you for sharing that. We definitely will reach back with PSI and see how we can uh, become involved with their new arm. So thank you. You're welcome. And we have another suggestion on the chat box. One organization you may want to reach out to is Nurse Family Partnership, a free program for its first-time moms who are in poverty. It is a nurse home visiting program where nurses visit clients from pregnancy all the way until the child turns two years old. 
Great. Again, um, if you have a contact, a direct contact with that organization, again, feel free to thank you for um, including that in the chat box. Um, I think I see my email address popped up. Please um, send that direct contact to me. If not, I will have uh, my contract support team uh, contact them. But if you know someone, that organization directly, we'd love to have that information. So thank you. Hi, my name is Dixie Morgis. I'm with the Healthy Start Coalition um, in Florida. And um, one of the things we're seeing a lot of is uh, women with substance use disorder who are trying to stay clean and uh, the birth process and the postpartum period becomes really fraught with a lot of a lot of anxiety, especially when they've had trauma. Um, and our OBGYN community is very reticent to um, really step in there with them. And uh, we see schools of thought where people are saying, well, put them back on medication-assisted treatment like buprenorphine or uh, methadone and Clearly, there's a um, you know there's a, a incident that's occurring in a postpartum period that it's related to the postpartum period, but they're very afraid of the Department of Children and Families and someone taking their child because of their substance history. And I just didn't know if you all are working on any you know materials that might help our provider um, community feel a, a better sense of efficacy in dealing with the whole intersection between the depression, anxiety, trauma, and substance use disorders? We have did not address that deliberately in our CME CE program for providers. We just addressed the importance of screening and bringing out the symptoms um, that have come to light through research, particularly the research, the anxiety symptoms and racing thoughts. But I think that is a very common um, issue, not only with women in trauma and, you know, with substance abuse, but just in general. Um, so I think directing them to the CME, again, it's not available for accreditation any further, but um, it will be um, housed on our website for education, maybe a first stop. Um, because I think the most important thing is to get them aware and get them in the system and get them hooked up to a mental health professional and or a substance abuse counselor. So that this may be a good first step. But, no, we did not address that deliberately in this particular initiative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have another question on the chat box. Um, hi, Dr. Fowler, representing the Healthy Star Program of Southern Nevada. We get a large number of teen females enrolling in our programs with current or past trauma. Is there any age-specific advice or materials devoted to that to that that speak for the age group and developmental stage? We did not um, include any ones for teen moms, but all of our materials are plain language, um, which are typically on a sixth grade reading level. Um, so they should be able to resonate, should, um, but we did not develop them specifically for children or specifically um, for that age group. But we did make sure that all of our materials were plain language. Any other questions for Dr. Fowler? Well, we have your email, and um, if there's anything else, feel free to reach out. We will be releasing the just the audio part of this. Dr. Fowler, did you want to see if we can release the slides at some point? Um, at some point, yes. We just have to run them through our um, clearance in uh, 508. Okay, so there's that. Dr. Fowler, I just want to say this is Dixie Morgese again. Somebody should just say thank you so much. This is so needed, it's so underreported, and it's so underaddressed, at least in our state and in our community. So thank you so much for all this hard work. Oh, no, thank you, and I totally agree with you. That's why we're in, in debt to you, City Match, for, for allowing us to um, use this platform again to educate those because I think it, this is an issue that's not owned by one specialty specifically, um, so it's all of us working together, OB, PEDS, mental health, family medicine, together to um, draw attention to it and to get women in treatment. So thank you again. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fowler, um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right.